Good morning, and on behalf of your family and friends here at United Baptist Church, we'd like to welcome you to our service this morning. We are celebrating Father's Day today. Oh, what a joy it is to be able to recognize our fathers. Oh, my goodness. Now, if you happen to be joining us uh, via the radio, uh, WBCI 105.9 on your FM dial, welcome. Welcome. You're, you're hearing this a little late, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> Special thanks to all of the folks down there at WBCI for their hard work in bringing this broadcast to you. Or you may be watching on our video link on our webpage, ubctopsum.org. That's ubctopsum, T-O-P-S-H-A-M dot O-R-G. And uh, welcome if you're watching there. Oh, my goodness. Uh, special thanks to all the folks here at United Baptist for their hard work. Linda and, and Andy and Lydia and all the others that uh, uh, put in such hard work to make sure that this comes to you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I can remember... A time when I was a kid, my family and I were on vacation in the mountains of Colorado. And there was, where we vacationed, there was a family that lived there. They lived about halfway between the highway and where we, our cabin was. And uh, uh, their names were the Krupps. And, and their oldest son, Kevin, was, was my age. Now, the Krupps lived there full time. They were... Uh, 12 month, they were, well, they were there, and they were outdoors folks through and through. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and we, of course, were city folks through and through. Oh, now when we would go out there on vacation, it was in the summertime and the Krups weren't always home. Uh, their summers were full, of course, of different camps and they had their vacations too. And and But uh, from time to time, from year to year, the Krupps would be there, and, and I would get to spend some time with Kevin. And this one particular year, Kevin was home, and uh, when he was home, he would take me out fishing, fishing for brook trout, native trout. And, and so uh, we were, he would take, take me out, and, and he knew where all of the good spots were, all of the places that were hard to get to, that the tourists and and the regular fishermen didn't, didn't, uh, didn't have the stamina to get back to, but Kevin knew where they were, and he would take me out there, go over some of the roughest terrain. But he knew where the fish were, and boy, we would catch a ton of fish. Well, anyways, as we were hiking back from one of our high lake adventures, Kevin came up with the idea that we should camp out that night. And I, of course, enthusiastically agreed, yes. Oh, my goodness. Kevin had all of the tent and the sleeping bags and all the supplies we needed. He had done this hundreds of times. Well, as a city kid at this point, <laughs> I had only camped out in a tent that we had made as boys in between our beds in our bedroom. <laughs> you know, the... the the uh, uh, bed sheets that were draped over and, and we crawled in underneath there. So, you know, this idea of actually camping out outside under the, that was the best idea ever. <laughs> well, as the day progressed along, we set up the tent. Uh, it, it was near the cabin that, that uh, we were staying in, only about 20 foot away from the front door because as we continued with our camp out plans, my excitement started to get paralleled with fear, a growing fear. This was something I had never done before. I really didn't know what to expect. Oh, <laughs> I had great ideas and, and visions of being a great outdoorsman and living out, out on, the, on the land all by myself, but thinking about it and dreaming about it and actually doing it can be altogether different. And besides, 
The folks that had stayed there at the cabin just the week earlier had reported that they had seen a bear just on the other side of the pond from the cabin. Oh, I got to tell you, the darker it got that evening, the more my fear overcame my excitement. About the only thing that I can remember of that night was lying there in that sleeping bag in the tent there, I was too afraid to even close my eyes. <laughs> if I blinked, it was only with one eye because the other eye had to stay open to see if, if there was anything out there. I laid there so still, I was like a plank. I was so rigid. I didn't even dare to move. I really did not think that I was going to survive that night. Oh my goodness, every sound every shadow that happened to go across the side of the tent, every hint of a breeze, I thought that meant that something was going to get me. Oh, I was never so glad to see the sun peek up over the mountaintop that next morning. Oh my goodness. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this glorious day, and I thank you for your very presence with us. There isn't a breath that we take. There isn't a beat of our heart, a blink of an eye that you aren't right there with us. We are at the center of your attention. And Father, I thank you for that personal uh, presence with us. Continue to be with us, Lord, to guard and protect and guide, but Lord, also to teach us along the way to take your lessons that you would have us to learn and to root them deep within our hearts. We thank you that you know exactly what we need when we need it. And Lord, I thank you for this message today. And I would just pray that you would help us to listen and to understand each one for ourselves. Thank you, Father. And I would pray here and now, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our joke this morning comes by the way of, of uh, 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 an old church. There was once a village church with a steeple that could be seen for miles around. It was perfect except for one thing the bell wouldn't ring. The church fathers invited people from all over, uh, trying their hands to remedy the situation, but to no avail. One day, a small fellow came to the church and announced to the pastor, I can make that bell ring. The pastor said, okay, give it a try. So the little guy climbed up to the base of the belfry in the steeple, took three steps back, and then ran into the bell with his face. <laughs> Bong! The bell rang, and he was hired on the spot. <laughs> One windy day, however, as the little man ran toward the bell, the wind moved it just a little bit, causing the small bell ringer to fall out of the steeple and onto the ground below. As a crowd gathered, the pastor asked, does anyone know this young fellow's name? Just then, a woman bent down low to look at him and then replied, Pastor, I don't know his name, but his face sure rings a bell. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, our scripture, let's get to more important stuff here. Our scripture this morning is, is from Mark. Mark chapter 4. Starting at verse 35, Mark chapter 4, starting at verse 35, we'll read through verse 41. And we read together, That day when the evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. 
The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This scripture is taken from the Gospel of Mark. We remember that the word gospel means good news. Mark is one of the four gospels that tells us of the good news of God becoming flesh, becoming human, and coming to earth. We know this to be Jesus Himself. And the Gospels tell us all of Jesus' time here on this earth. That is good news for us because it shows God's unconditional love for each and every one of us. And here this morning, we're looking at a particular event here that happened over the course of Jesus' life. Jesus had been teaching. We, we actually looked at the verses just before these last week. Jesus was teaching, and there was such a large crowd that had gathered to hear Him speak that He had gotten into a boat. And, and while the crowd stayed on the shore, He went out a few feet so everyone could hear His teaching. And there He was teaching them in parables. And we remember what a parable is. A, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And you'll, you'll remember with me, last week we took a look at uh, verses 33 and 34, where it reads, with many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. That evening, as Jesus finished up his teaching, he instructed the disciples to take them, all the group, over to the other side of the lake. Leaving the crowd there on the shore, they began their voyage across the lake. Now, this was something that many of the disciples had probably done many, many times in their lifetime. Some of the disciples were fishermen, and being fishermen, most of their fishing was done at night. And they had probably rowed across that lake many times before. No big deal, right? Unless a storm blew up. Oh, and they were also familiar with those lake storms. Oh, their boats uh, that were not quite as sturdy as ours are today. And I hear stories even today of when the wind picks up over at Sebago Lake. you got to take notice and you have to be ready. If not, you're, you need to be headed towards the docks. Well, we saw it coming, didn't we? As they were going across the lake, a storm, we're told, did blow up as they were out there in the middle. The waves were so big and they were coming over the sides. I can just imagine some of the guys there inside that boat rowing frantically. Oh my goodness. While others were there bailing out the water. Even, we're told, the experienced fishermen were wondering if they were going to make it across. <sighs> yeah. They were scared. And then, when things were at their worst, Somebody looks and they see Jesus. And Jesus is sleeping. Now, we're not told exactly who went to Jesus to wake him up. <laughs> okay, we're just told that it was the disciples. But anyways, they went and they woke Jesus up. And I am certain that he could tell by their voices, I, that, that high-pitched voice that... that uh, when you are afraid, when you are full of fear, it, and, 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 and they talk very, very quickly, Teacher, <laughs> don't you care that we drown? 
they said. <laughs> they were scared to death. Jesus gets up and hollers at the storm. The wind died down and the waves drew even. And we are told that it was completely calm. And then Jesus turns to his disciples and asks those two questions. Why? Are you so afraid? And do you still have no faith? Things can get pretty rough in our lives today, don't they? There are times when we just think that there isn't any way that we are going to make it through. Maybe we are like a scared kid in a tent, afraid to move, because terror has us in its grip. Or maybe we're doing all we can. We're, we're rowing, we're bailing, and we're just slipping further and further under the water. The waves keep getting bigger and bigger. The world seems to be going to hell in a handbasket, right? War is all around us. Turmoil, pandemics. We see and hear things that boggle our mind, and we ask ourselves, how can anybody or how can anything like this be happening? We don't understand. And when things are at their very worst, we look around and we think Jesus isn't paying any, any attention to what's happening. We're think, we think Jesus has fallen asleep. We cry out to them, Jesus, save us! And it is like he is asking us those same questions. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? He was telling those disciples that evening and us here today that what he wants us to do is just to keep doing what he has assigned us to do. He will take care of the rest. He will take care of the rest. Many of you have heard me speak before of a older woman that I knew. Her name was Jean Bliss. She was a pillar of faith for centuries. No, not centuries, decades. <laughs> if she was a pillar of faith for centuries, it would have been remarkable. No, 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 no. It was just decades. <laughs> In her last years, we had quite a few discussions about what faith is. Jean was trying to put it into words, understandable words, words that would make sense to her. And then one day as I was standing there, she came in and she handed me a note. And there written on that note was a quote that she had found. And she simply exclaimed, I found it. I found it. And I looked at the note and I had to smile as I read it because I knew right then and there what she had found. She had found a quote. And that quote said, faith is not believing without proof. It is trust without reservation." It is a quote that Jean had found that was, that was from Elton Trueblood, a, a 20th century Quaker uh, theologian. He was the chaplain of, of Harvard and, and Stanford at, at one point in time. She had found Trueblood's quote, and that held firm with her. Our lives do get tough. There are those times when we feel like we are at the end of our rope and our grip is slipping, just like those disciples did that day on that boat. Where do we put our trust? Where do we put our faith? In our own abilities? Or do we put our trust in the one that even controls nature itself. The wind and the waves obey him. 
Because we see after Jesus calmed the storm, the disciple, their fear transitioned from, from the fear of the storm to the amazement and the fear of Jesus' power. They asked, quite frankly, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. Faith is not belief without proof. It is trust without reservation. This Father's Day, do you trust in Jesus today. Fathers, what a great gift you can give to your family. A dedicated leader, dedicated to Christ, and dedicated to them. And family members, what a great gift that you can give your father this Father's Day and to dedicate yourself to Christ, the one who created us, the one that commands the winds and the waves in who we can trust without reservation. Let us pray. Gracious Father, I thank you again for this glorious day, and I thank you for your message for us here today. A message that the words were the same, but a message that has been tailored to each and every one of us. In your special way, you have spoken to us through your word this morning. And Father, continue your work in and through us. Continue to mold us into the people that you would have us to be. And help us, Father, to trust in you more and more each day. Thank you, Father. And Lord, I just pray here and now that you would be with us as we come before you, not only with our hearts and our minds, but with our voices raised in prayer, as together we pray that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.